Hi, my name is Alex Castano. I'm the new events coordinator for the Clearwater Historical Society. And today we're starting a brand new speaker series. I'm the first one to be speaking today. I'm a photographer, author, and historian. And the topic of today's presentation is Historic Pinellas County. And we'll be having these presentations bi-weekly, so it'll be the next presentation in two weeks. So stay tuned for that. So how Pinellas County became a county. On January 1st, 1912, Pinellas County officially separated from West Hillsboro County. Pinellas County got its name from the Spanish as they referred to this area as Punta Pinal, which means Point of Pines. Now we're going to journey into Tarpon Springs. This is a Tarpon Springs sponge exchange. It was founded by John Cheney and Ernest R. Mears between 1907 and 1908. It was a place for sponge diving crews to auction their sponges to the shop merchants and bidding sponge dealers. The auction took place twice a week. Uh, the sponge exchange officially closed and part of it was demolished in 1981. In 1983, a shopping village was opened and currently exists on this historic site. Some of the remnants of the old sponge exchange still exist. And a lot of these photos, actually most of these photos, are taken by me. The so now we go to the Tarpon Springs Historical Museum. The Orange Belt Railway arrived in Tarpon Springs in 1887. The first railway depot was destroyed by a fire in 1908. In 1909, the second and current building was built. By the 1970s, rail service had ended and the building became the home of the Tarpon Springs Historical Society. And the museum maintains several historical collections and artifacts related to the history of Tarpon Springs. Now we journey on to Palm Harbor. This is the Palm Harbor Museum. It was originally the home of Thomas and Ida Hartley and their family. Thomas bought the property from his father and built the family's home between the years 1914 and 1919. In the 1996, the property was acquired by, the, by Pinellas County. In 1998, the Palm Harbor Museum was open to the public. This is the Boot Ranch. Boot Ranch was a cattle ranch owned by Al Boyd in Eastlake, which is a section of Palm Harbor. The ranch featured Brahmin cattle, and the boot was constructed by Lawrence Auden, who was a good friend of Al Boyd. Or in the early 1950s, it was constructed. The boot is still standing today. It's located in the shops of Boot Ranch Plaza. Now we venture into Dunedin. This is Honeymoon Island. It acquired its name from the newlywed couples that spent their honeymoon on the island. In the 1930s, a man by the name of Clinton Washburn purchased the island. In 1940, 50 honeymoon cottages were built. Unfortunately, the cottages fell into disrepair. The land was sold in the 1960s to a developer who was planning a residential development on the island. In the 80s, the state of Florida turned Honeymoon Island into a Florida State Park, which still remains to this day. And I'm so glad the state of Florida did that because it's important to preserve our historic places as well as our natural resources. Because if we don't, it'll be developed into condominiums or other things it'll be developed into, and that's not a good thing. Now we venture into Caladesi Island. Before the great hurricane of 1921, Honeymoon and Caladesi were one big island named Hog Island. Henry Scherer was a pioneer who homesteaded on present-day Caladesi Island. Henry lived with his wife, Catherine, and their daughter, Myrtle, who was born on the island in 1895. In the 1980s, Myrtle published a book recollecting her life memories titled Yesteryear I Lived in Paradise, and Caladesi is now also a Florida State Park. 
Next, we have Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic Church. It was founded in 1958 and built that same year. The first priest to serve at the church was Reverend William Du Bois. Church building, excuse me, was built in 1977. The original church building is now a Catholic school which serves grades pre-K through eighth grade. This is the Dunedin History Museum. The first railroad depot, it was originally a railroad depot, it was built by the Orange Belt Railway in 1888. It was later replaced in 1902 by the Atlanta Coast Depot. The second railroad depot burned to the ground between the years 1921 and 1922. The third and final Atlanta Coast Depot built in 1922 and served the community of Dunedin until the mid-80s when it became the home of the Dunedin Historical Society Museum. This is the Dixie Theater. It was Dunedin's first motion picture and stage theater, which opened to the public in 1919. Currently, the building that housed the theater is home to Casa Tina and Back in the Day Books. This is the Fenway Hotel. The historic Fenway was built in 1924. Originally, the hotel housed a radio station, which came in 1927. It officially opened to the public as a hotel in 1928. The building had many uses over the years, including Trinity College in 1961 and Sheeler International University in 1990. In 2010, the building was closed. In 2018, the Fenway reopened as a luxury hotel. It is currently owned and operated by Main Sale Lodging and Development. Next, we have the Dunedin Public Library, which is the oldest library in Pinellas County. It was started by Mr. C.B. Burden in 1895, who donated 200 books for public use. Originally, the library was housed in a building located in present-day Edgewater Park. In 1935, the city of Dunedin took over ownership of the library. In the 1950s, the library moved to a building located on Loudoun Avenue, which is the current city hall of Dunedin. Uh, it was later moved again in the 1960s. It was later moved after that again to the Douglas Plaza Shopping Center, so it moved several times, and the building that was located in the plaza was eventually demolished and replaced by the current building. The current building was opened to the public in 1996, and it's been home of the library ever since. Now we venture into Clearwater. This is Sylvan Abbey Memorial Park. It's a cemetery that was established in 1853. It's the oldest cemetery in Pinellas County. Some notable burials include Charles D. Chick Young. He was the creator of the comic strip Bondi. Alfredo Antonini, who was a famous conductor for CBS Music and CBS TV. Angela Dundee, who was a famous boxing trainer. Courtney Campbell, who was the namesake of the Courtney Campbell Cause That Way, which connects Clearwater to Tampa. This is Sam Ash and the historic Capoc tree. In the 1870s, a man by the name of Robert Hoyt planted one of two Capoc trees that he bought from India. In the 1950s, a band leader by, and singer by the name of Richard Baumgartner bought the property. Richard built and designed a restaurant called the Kapok Tree in and opened it in 1958. Uh, people would visit the Kapok Tree from all over the world. After Richard's death, his family took over ownership of the property. They sold the property to investors in 1993 and it was sold again in 1999 to Sam Ash Music Stores, which is currently um, today. It's currently Sam Ash, and the Cape Buck tree still remains on the property, blooming and beautiful as always. As you can see here, um, right here in the picture, I don't know if you could see it, but if you can, it's right there. Um, it's still present. This is Calvary Church. It was 
Originally founded in 1886 as Midway Baptist Church, over the years the church has had several name changes and many pastors. It was officially named Calvary Baptist Church of Clearwater in 1923. The church grew over the years and it acquired the land for its current campus in 1999. It moved to its present site in 2005 on McMullen Booth Road. It has two other church locations, one in East Lake, one in Seminole. This is Dairy Crawl. It was originally built in the 1960s. An iconic ice cream stand serves different varieties of ice creams, milkshakes, and more. It's located on Gulf to Bay Boulevard if you want to check it out. It's still there. This is a Clearwater Library system. The first temporary location of the Clearwater Library was a subscription library located on Cleveland Street. The library received a grant from the Carnegie Foundation to build a permanent structure which officially opened to the public in 1916. And the Carnegie Foundation was founded by Andrew Carnegie. He created a foundation for those that are deserving, um, for people that couldn't afford books. Um, so he awarded grants to several libraries to be built and open to the public. So the first original Clearwater Main Library before they built the current one uh, and before that received a grant from the Carnegie Foundation to help um, build that. It opened in 1916. The library grew over time and took place um, renovations took place on the Clearwater Main Branch. Multiple locations were added to the library system, including the North Greenwood Library in 1950 and the Clearwater Beach Library to serve the Clearwater Beach residents in the 1960s. The Clearwater Countryside Library was built in the 1980s, but later moved to its present location in 2015. The Clearwater East Library, which was also built in the 1980s, uh, moved to its current place, which is at the St. Petersburg Clearwater Campus. The current main library building was opened in 2004, and it's part of the Pinellas Public Library Cooperative. The Clearwater Public Library System offers many programs, events, services, and materials to the public who have a Pinellas Public Library card. This is the Capitol Theater, now named the Nancy and David Bellheimer Capitol Theater. The Capitol Theater opened to the public in 1921. It has showcased many productions, events, and cinema over the years. It's currently owned by the City of Clearwater, and the City of Clearwater partnered with Ruth Eckert Hall to manage and operate this historic theater. This is the Old County Courthouse. Pinellas County originally separated from Hillsborough County on January 1, 1912. The newborn county needed a county seat, a courthouse, and a government offices. In 1912, the new, newly appointed and elected officials built a temporary building in Clearwater that was later replaced by this building, which was built in 1918. It has been uh, restored and still stands today, functioning as one of the locations of the courthouse. Here we are today at the Clearwater Historical Society. And the Clearwater Historical Society was founded in 1978 by Gene Homer to preserve the history of Clearwater. The current location of the Clearwater Historical Society is the Old South Ward Elementary School, which I'm sure many of you attended watching this, which was built in 1906, but it was closed in 2008. Also located on the property is the original Clearwater High School building, which is right next to the gray building you see here, the white one. Um, it was built in 1912. The high school later moved to the Greenwood section of Clearwater in 1924. The high school building located on the property also served as the Clearwater Junior High School from 1924 until 1964. The Clearwater Historical Society is currently open to the public, and I'm glad it is, and I'm glad to be here, as well as the new events coordinator. This is the Bellevue Inn, formerly the Bellevue Biltmore, the Hotel Bellevue. It was originally built by Henry Plant in 1897. 
Henry Plant was a railroad magnet, and he was famous for building the Tampa Bay Hotel, now the home of the University of Tampa and Henry B. Plant Museum. Henry Sant Morden Plant was famous for founding the Morden Plant Hospital in Clearwater in 1916. The Bellevue Biltmore had 145 guest rooms, and many famous guests stayed in the hotel, including presidents, dignitaries, uh, musicians, and other uh, people that were important stayed at the Bellevue Biltmore. The hotel celebrated its 100th anniversary in 1997. It fell into decline and closed in 2009. In 2016, a developer by the name of JMC Communities developed a plan to save the historic Bellevue Biltmore, and they preserved a portion of the hotel. It reopened to the public in 2018, and it's owned and operated by the Opal Collection. This is Ward Seafood Market. It's been a staple of Clearwater's area for fresh fish. It all started in eight, uh, 1955 when Millie Ward and her husband Johnny Ward started selling fresh fish that they would catch locally. Wards quickly grew and built their current building in 1956. It's still family owned and operated to this day. This is Bob Hillman's Beach Comer. It's located on Clearwater Beach. It was started in 1948 by Robert and Eva Hillman. In 1959, the original building was destroyed by a fire. Robert and Eva quickly rebuilt the restaurant and reopened it soon after the fire. It has been a popular restaurant and still remains in Clearwater Beach. It is still family owned and operated. Now we venture into Oldsmar. This is the Oldsmar Historical Society and Museum. It occupies in the Oldsmar Bank Building, which was built in 1918 by Ransom Eli Olds, who was the namesake of Oldsmar. Ransom E. Olds was the founder of the Oldsmobile Motor Company, and not only did the building serve as the Oldsmar Bank from 19... Uh, from 1920 to 1933, but it had many other uses, including a machine shop, a location for the Oldsmar Post Office, a grocery store, the town's youth center, Oldsmar City Hall, and the Oldsmar Library before it became the home of the Oldsmar Historical Society. And when Ransom Eli Olds purchased uh, land in Oldsmar. He envisioned it to be a retirement community for people to come and live there. So that's why he decided to name it after him. Now we venture into Safety Harbor, which was originally called Green Springs. This is Philippi Park. It became a Pinellas County Park in 1948, which makes it the oldest park in the county. It was originally the home of O'Day Philippi, who introduced Fran uh, citrus from France to the Tampa Bay area. Some of the park's features include a historic Native American Tokabaga Temple Mound, a memorial dedicated to O'Day Philippi, a playground for children, nature trails, picnic shelters, as well as many other amenities. And you can visit there today. It's a nice park. It's a beautiful uh, thing to do. Now we venture to the Safety Harbor Resort and Spa. It was originally called the Spiritu Santo Springs, which means Holy Spirit Springs. It's believed the waters have healing powers. The springs were originally discovered by Hernan Hernando de Soto. Excuse me. In 1926, it became the Safety Harbor Sanatorium. The property was later sold in 1945 to Dr. Salem Barnoff, who turned the location into a health spa. It was cur it's currently the Safety Harbor Resort and Spa. Dr. Barnoff was instrumental in the creation, or not the creation, but helping with keeping the Safety Harbor uh, Library alive. He gave a lot of money, and you know the oak tree right next to the Safety Harbor Library that was named in honor of Dr. Barnoff, who gave a lot of money to help the library continue. So that's why they named it the Barnoff Oak. And next time you go there, uh, you could see this magnificent 500-year-old oak, um, and it's gated. You can't go touch it, but you can see 
the barn off oak, which is a historic oak tree. Now we venture into Pinellas Park. This is the Barbara S. Pons Public Library, formerly the Pinellas Park Public Library. It was originally organized in 1948. The currently library building was built in 1969. Barbara S. Pons served as the library director from 1985 to 1999. She was an integral part of the library and the community of Pinellas Park by adding new programs, events, and even helping with the expansion of the library in 2001. Now we move over to Anona, Bay Pines, Largo, and Seminole. And Anona is a section of Indian Rocks and Largo, so that's a, so if you're wondering what Anona is for all those curious, it's a section of Largo and Indian Rocks. This is Largo Public Library. It was started by the Largo Women's Club. The first location was opened to the public in 1916. The library moved to its second location, which opened to the public in 1968, and moved to its third location, which was opened in 1977, and moved again in 2005 to its current site, which is located in Largo Central Park. Before the library came to Largo Central Park, that's where they would have the Tampa Bay Renaissance Festival. They moved that uh, from Largo Central Park to, I think, uh, Tampa, uh, over there in Tampa. You could still go to the Renaissance Festival, but before that, it was located in Largo Central Park where the library is today. This is the Largo Feed Store. It was moved to Largo Central Park in 1920. 92 is built in 1910 and was originally run as a feed store by Frances Campbell who owned and operated the Hotel Largo, excuse me. She ran the feed store until she passed away in 1912. The store went through many ownership changes over the years and it's currently the home of the Largo Area Historical Society. And the Largo Area Historical Society will be coming in June. Um, to be presenting on the history of Largo, so make sure you tune into that. This is the Lewis Johnson Building. It was built between the years 1910 and 1911 by Lewis Steely Johnson. It was originally a hotel, and currently the building is vacant. But it still stands, and I'm so glad it does. This is the Nona United Methodist Church. It was built in 1882. Located behind the chapel is the site of the Nona Pioneer Cemetery, which is now part of Serenity Gardens, which is a historic cemetery that most of um, South Pinellas County pioneers are buried there. So if you're wondering that, it's now part of Serenity Gardens. This is Heritage Village, originally Heritage Park. It's a historic village with 33 structures from around Pinellas County. It was started in 1976. The first two structures to arrive at Heritage Village were the House of Seven Gables, which is a yellow house um, that was originally from Clearwater, um, and the Plant Sumner House. The village has two exhibit halls, including the Ralph Reed Gallery, which features the collection of artifacts from uh, the Turner family who were prominent in the Clearwater area, and the Roy Helms Gallery, which features artifacts from around the county. Heritage Village is also home to the Pinellas County Historical Society, and it's located in Largo. This is the Seminole Log Cabin. It was built in 1935, and it's located on Seminole Boulevard. The cabin has had several uses over the years, including the home of the Seminole Civic Club, also known as the Seminole Community House. It has hosted a variety of club events, um, as well as uh, fish fries and Boy Scout troop meetings. This is Bay Pines. It was built in the early 30s, 1930s. Bay Pines is operated by the federal government uh, under the Department of Veterans Affairs. The campus consists of a several veterans' hospitals, a cemetery, a post office, and a police department. And the building that's now the police department was originally a railroad depot. The railroad came through there and would deliver supplies to the hospital. Uh, but now, since the ra railroad is all gone, um, it still runs limitedly, but they turned the building into a police department. 
This is Indian Rocks Beach and Indian Shores. This is the Indian Rocks Historical Museum. It was originally organized in 1981. The museum is currently housed in a beach cottage that was built in 1939. Previously to becoming a museum, it was the residence of Carl and Caroline Mosley. The museum features many exhibits about the local history of Indian Rocks Beach. Now we venture into Mandira Beach. This is the Candy Kitchen. Uh, it's a great place to find nostalgic candies from the past, and it's one of my favorite places to visit in Madeira Beach. The kitchen, the candy kitchen, excuse me, also features many tasty treats, including their homemade ice cream and homemade fudge. They have three locations, with this being their oldest location, founded in 1950 in Madeira Beach. The second store is located in Reddington Shores, and the third store is located in Indian Rocks Beach. This is John's Pass Bridge, which connects Madeira Beach and Tre with Treasure Island. In 1848, Madeira Beach and Treasure Island were split in two by a hurricane creating John's Pass. The pass was named after John Levique, who supposedly buried his treasure before the storm of 1848, as the legend goes. Construction began on the first Johns Pass Bridge in the late 1920s, and the original drawbridge was replaced in 1971 with the new drawbridge, which was renovated in 2013. Now we go to Treasure Island. This is Gator's Cafe and Saloon, originally the Kingfish Restaurant. It was owned by the Rice family. The Kingfish Restaurant was opened in the 1940s, but later closed and moved to a new location. Descendants from the original Rice family um, of the Kingfish took over ownership of the building and opened Gators, which is still there to this day. Though it has gone through many ownership changes, it still remains a strong component of Treasure Island's past, present, and future. This is St. Pete Beach in Pasigro. This is Silas Steakhouse. Um, prior to the Silas Steakhouse, it was the home of the London Wax Museum. The museum featured many different famous wax figures from the past. The museum opened to the public in 1963 and closed in 1989. Silas Steakhouse was named after Silas Dent, a hermit who lived on Cabbage Key, which is now part of Tia Verde. The Steakhouse originally opened in 1979, but unfortunately closed in 2018. The restaurant featured many of Silas Den's personal items at, that decorated the steakhouse. This is the Don Cesar Hotel. It was built by Thomas Lowe. It was opened to the public in 1928. The hotel went through many ownership changes throughout the years, including the United States Army for a time, which operated the hotel. It was closed temporarily during the war years, but later reopened as a hotel in the 1970s. And it's been opened ever since. The hotel has featured many films and books. Some nicknames include the Pink Palace and the Dawn. The hotel has, has 277 rooms and other amenities to the hotel guests. This is the Gulf Beaches Historical Museum. It was founded in 1993. Previously, this building served as the first church of Pasigro, called Pasigro Community Church, until the late 50s. Uh, once the church relocated, a woman by the name of Joan Haley purchased the building. It served as her home until her death in, in 1989. She willed the building to Pinellas County, um, and the building was built in 1917 and serves as the Gulf Beaches Historical Museum. The museum is completely run by volunteer staff uh, and it features many photographs, artifacts, documents, and exhibits that illustrate the history and the development of the Gulf Beaches and Barrier Islands. Now we venture over to St. Petersburg. This is Fort DeSoto. It's housed on five keys that are connected together. The keys include Madeline Key, St. Jean Key, St. Christopher Key, Bon Fortune Key, and Mullet Key. The fort was built on Mullet Key and the construction started in 1898. 
By 1903, the construction was complete. In 1900, the fort was named after Hernando de Soto, a Spanish explorer that came to the area. There was no major battles fought on Fort de Soto. The land was acquired by the federal government for use for the United States Armed Forces. The land was sold back to Pinellas County in 1948. The property officially opened to the public in 1963 as a park. Ever since, it's the largest Pinellas County park. Fort de Soto offers many amenities, including a fort with military batteries, two fishing piers, a museum, nature trails, camping areas, beaches, and more. It's a great place to explore, and you have to take the Pinellas Bayway to get there uh, and go over to Tia Verde. So it's a nice ride. It's a long ride, but it's worth it to go down there. This is Aigmon Key. You have to take a boat to get to Aigmon Key or a ferry. It originally served as a fort from 1898 until 1923 called Fort Dade. It was originally by the United, owned by the United States Armed Forces. The original lighthouse was built in 1848, but it was destroyed due to a hurricane that hit the area that year, and that's the same hurricane that split John's Pass in two. The lighthouse was rebuilt in 1858 and still remains to this day. Egamon Key is currently a Florida State Park and it's located right across from Fort DeSoto Park. This is Haslam's Bookstore, a bookstore located on, on Central Avenue in St. Petersburg. Haslam's Bookstore was started in 1933 uh, by John and Mary Haslam. It is still family owned and operated. They have two resident cats named Teacup and Beowulf. They sell new, used, and rare books, and it's a great place to go to find books. I, I enjoy going there when I'm down in St. Pete. This is Sunken Gardens. It's been a popular attraction in the St. Petersburg area since 1935 when it was open to the public. The property was purchased originally in 1903 by George Turner, who was a plumber. In the 1990s, the garden was purchased by the city of St. Petersburg, and St. Sunken Gardens is still operating to this day. The garden features waterfalls, flamingos, tropical, and exotic plants, and it's a great place to go on 4th Street uh, in St. Petersburg, 4th Street North. This is the St. Petersburg Open Air Post Office. It has served the community of St. Petersburg since 1917, when it first opened. In 19, it was built in 1916, a year before it opened. It was the first open air post office in the United States. The mail carriers used bicycles to deliver the mail to the residents of the city of St. Petersburg. This is the St. Petersburg Mirror Lake Community Library, originally the main community library. It was built in 1915 before uh, the Mirror Lake, or the main branch of the St. Petersburg Library system, it moved um, to its current location in 1964. And this is also, uh, like I was saying before, Andrew Carnegie awarded grants to. Um, libraries and so this was another one in 1915 they got awarded a grant to be built this library this is the st petersburg coliseum it was built in 1924 it originally served as a ballroom and dance hall but now it serves as an event hall for various functions and concerts it was originally owned for a time by band leader rex mcdonald it's currently owned and operated by the city of St. Pete. And actually, when I was going to a record store, I actually found this record, uh, Dance Along with Rex, um, Rex McDonald and his Silver Kings. Um, it's his band, and it was a record that he did. It's a local pressing, so um, it's a limited edition, so I'm happy that I found that. I thought that was cool Coliseum in St. Pete history item that I have in my collection. This is a St. Petersburg Pier. It has quite the history. The first pier was called the Railroad Pier, which was built in 1888. It was replaced with other piers over the years. 
The million dollar pier, which was built in 1925, was demolished in 1967 to make way for an inverted pyramid pier, which was built in the 1970s, which is this one, and closed in 2013. It was demolished in 2015 to make way for a new pier, which is currently still under construction. The St. Petersburg Pier photograph is current courtesy of my grandmother. That's the only one that I didn't take. And thank you for letting me use that. This is St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church. It's the oldest church in Pinellas County. It was organized in 1887 and built that same year. Dr. John Abercrombie donated the land for the church. The church still holds services in the original church building. This is Gulfport. This is a Gulfport Casino, which was originally built in 1906, but it was destroyed in 1921 due to a hurricane that hit the area. The casino was later rebuilt in 1924, which was demolished in the early 1930s. The third and current casino was built in 1934 and was opened to the public in 1935. It, is, it still stands today and serves as a ballroom for gatherings. The casino has never housed any gambling, but has been used for various events and functions throughout the years. So this concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.